Um, this is probably the most hardest introduction I'll make all night. Um, Tom Shanks, who uh, is the founder of Technical Sports Solutions um, and is the CoachLogic account manager. Um, me and Tom go way back. Tom was a, a, a lecturer here at St. Mary's University on two and a half occasions, um, <laughs> leaving to go and work with uh, the England underage team squads. Um, and also, I've worked with him uh, as part of the Chelsea Football Club Academy for the last uh, 10 or so years. Um, so uh, Tom will uh, present to us today on pushing buttons, more than just a space bar and a return button, um, and involving players in the analysis process. Tom, over to you. Evening everyone, thanks Michael. Um, really nice to see you again, having only seen you three times last week. Um, <coughs> So yeah, uh, I'm Tom, uh, thanks for having me in. I've called this pushing buttons because one is kind of tongue in cheek with um, how Michael just said and how he introduced us. There's a bit of a running joke that all we do is watch games and push buttons, but that is part of what an analyst does, obviously. But much more importantly, uh, we need to understand how we push the buttons of the people that we work with, both players and coaches. Um, if we consider that, um, regardless of what process you have as an analyst, as a, as a coaching team, we have to ensure that our players are at the centre of that. So then if we consider that no two coaching contexts are the same, no two individuals are the same, no two days are the same, then our process is going to have to have a bit of flex in it. We're going to have to be able to adapt to different scenarios, often problems or, um, or personnel perhaps as well. So most importantly, if we just bear in mind all the way through that we have to keep the player at the centre of this. So the, the kind of traditional idea of, of an analysis session might look a bit like this. So coach at the front of the room um, delivering content to uh, a group of players. Analysts looking maybe slightly bored on the, uh, at the side there, but flicking through clips and things like that. And the issue that has been labelled at this approach is that footballers and athletes in general need to be doing something rather than just watching and being told. So there's, in recent years there's been a move away, attempted move away with developing players in particular from this type of technique. I would not go as far as to say it, it shouldn't be used, it certainly has a place. But how we do it is probably more important than what we do and even more important than both of those is why we do it. So you, we can use a whole load of techniques, but if there isn't a reason why we, we're doing and, and using these techniques to review, to help players learn, so, and, and these days as well to help coaches develop as well, then um, we, we're quite often going to come unstuck. So my kind of response to that argument would be that if it was either of these two that were presenting to a group of footballers, the young footballers in particular, let's take an under-16 squad, I believe that this group of players would be far more engaged in, in the information that's just being spoken and shown to them. Today might not be the best day to catch either of these if you saw what happened to both of them yesterday, but um, th there's one response there. So <clears throat> without going too far into academia or, or, or research, just to use real basic terms, okay, so if we consider different responses that people prefer or, or are um, uh, sensitive to, okay, some people might like to watch footage back and, and learn from that way. Others might like to get hands on and do stuff. Others might like to have conversations and, and, and listen to what um, key stakeholders have to say, like a coach or hopefully an analyst. And others like to, to do task-based activities as well, where you might read, write things down, keep journals and that sort of thing. So what you might end up with, the danger that we might end up with is that in our group of players here, we've actually got, oh, Oh, I had a really cool animation there, but it hasn't come through. Our group of players here might split evenly into those four corners of the page. So by having one method of analysing games or developing learning, we're actually not facilitating learning or engagement in three quarters of the group, potentially. So in my mind's eye, the way that I would see a, a player um, is something like this. We've got those four areas that I just spoke about, and at the centre of this process is each individual player. Now, 
having joined in on, around the outside are different techniques I've used in the past. So I don't want to turn away from you while I'm speaking, but the mic's just here, so I'll do a bit of oasis. So we've got the more te technology-based methods along here. We've got an iPad there, so we can either use that remotely or we can do it in-house if we're lucky enough. We've got players that like to write things down, work as a group, more social. So our player profile, if you like, might look something like that. So this player likes to be hands-on, so he might get a tactics board out, very social, so he might do some more presentation uh, and, and collaborative work and that sort of thing. The player sitting next to them might prefer these types of methods. So they might be a bit more uh, responsive to that traditional approach, and the player next to them might be different as well. So again, very social, so we get them into some groups over here um, and get them presenting and that sort of thing, but we probably won't bother too much with technology an awful lot. And, and certainly not getting them to write things down. But understanding what makes these players tick and understanding what buttons to push is key to this process being successful. All students love to play FIFA, right? So what I'm, the way that I have tried to articulate it is by having physical attributes uh, or, or performance attributes up here about how good a player is or what, what they might bring towards a team. From an analyst point of view, if you're looking to have creative and flexible workshops, you might create profiles, even if it's in your, in your mind, but have profiles for these players about how they respond. And ideally, each player in your mind might have something like that. So on the back of that, we can take our England lineup and we can say, well, actually, Pickford works really well with these guys over here. So we're going to move him out of this defensive group and put him up there. And Dele Alli is going to take his place because he works really well in, these, in, in the same way that these guys work. So, just as a kind of illustration of how my mind works, that's how I would try and think about how we might use players uh, working together. For those that like to see things, we're fortunate enough these days that we've got the technology that Dan just, and, and Besim just demonstrated where we can highlight players on videos. But if we need to strip that back, that's no problem. Let's just think out of the box a little bit. We can get a Sabutio board out or a Tactics board out and start to illustrate those. And by doing things like that, we also engage our players that like to do stuff. And there's a few examples of, of the types of techniques we might use. On the subject of the players that like to do things, we might use our web-based, which are quite commonplace now in academy football and, and uh, uh, professional football, our web-based apps. So games get uploaded and everyone can join in. With Coach Logic, we have a, uh, a workshop where we'll, we'll split the game into 10-minute sections, nine groups, and in 10 minutes, the whole game's done. And those, uh, the information those players produce forms the basis of the conversations that then take place. Looks a little bit, looks something like that, where players are kind of in a group, camp around a, a computer, but it also facilitates uh, those that like to see things happening as well, and there's loads of different ways that you can manipulate the environment to, to do that. Uh, a task that we did recently with uh, Fulham women's team is, is literally get them to write down um, what their perception of the language that was being used by the coach was. So same messages are, are being given every game, so players in their groups went away and they together agreed on what they perceived as the meaning of, of these uh, terms. And they pinned them on the board and then they presented why they thought this back to the, the group. By virtue of doing, kind of standing up and presenting in front of the group, those people were kind of hopefully hitting these types of responders as well. And there's, again, once you start thinking about how people respond, you can be really creative and have a wide range of techniques that you might use. Going back to the start, if you like, our traditional approach where the coach is, is at the top of the room speaking, okay, there's certainly a place for it based on, hopefully, based on the, the argument I've put forward. And there's loads of ways we can do this. And forgetting technology or, or little gizmos that you might use, sometimes the most effective conversation you can have as a coach or an analyst is what I call corridor coaching. Some players will not respond to any type of workshop you try and put together, no matter how good you think it is. But in two minutes after the session, you might accidentally, but on purpose, bump into them in the corridor and have a quick chat with them, just to gauge where they are with it. Some players, some people just won't like the scenarios you're trying to create. So always be aware that some might just need a quick five minutes of your time just to go through, even if they don't want it, seem to want it, um, if that makes sense. So I call that corridor coaching, which is hugely effective. So, Ultimately, what we end up with is a group of players, and our, our job as analysts is to understand who's in the room. Hopefully, we can start to build these profiles of our players, and then we can put our imaginary lineup for workshops. So depending on what the themes are and how we might think we're going to, we might use a bit of video, we might use some task-based and problem-based uh, 
problem-based tasks in this session, we might start to put together groups that we know will work better together. So these guys are going to use technology, these guys are going to write things down, we're going to get those in a group to present and that sort of thing. Once we establish like, who's who and, and who, what, what buttons to push with each player, we can then decide what our techniques are to hopefully engage them in the analysis process. Hopefully that will make sense. Apologies if I've rambled on a little bit, Tom, but happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. I'd forgotten what a great lecturer you were, so thank you for reminding us all of what, we, what we're missing. Um, some, you, you also blew my mind there when linking theories of learning with performance analysis. I, I didn't think those two would ever be uh, discussed in the same presentation. Um, it, it's, for me, it was really interesting how you linked and identified some of the challenges of individualising the learning for the players, and, and in particular, um, how sometimes I think we forget the, the social aspects of reflecting and analysing performance. So, again, thank you very much for that.